Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Sophie Goodwin. Today I'm going to be sitting down with Jack Scott. She's a tenured Army Special Ops Warrant Officer. Is that, do I have that right, Jax? You do, Sophie. He's also a published author, influencer. I mean, the list goes on, but I won't spoil it. I'll let I'll let Jax tell us all about that. How are you doing today, Jax? I appreciate you joining us. I am so excited to be here. Thank you, Sophie. So I'm looking forward to kind of just jumping right in. I did, I don't want to say stalked, but I did like do a little research and like look into a little bit of your background and I just was fascinated and I got like sucked into a rabbit hole. So it looks like uh, you have experience in special ops, you have co-authored a book, uh, you've had several different different positions that you've held in cybersecurity. Could we sort of get the, I guess, spark notes on your story? Yeah, the 10,000 foot view down. So I started my journey in the military. That's how I kind of broke into cybersecurity. In 2008, I rebranched, requalified, just went to a different school for information technology. Cyber wasn't a thing back then. And so at that time, this was 2008. Um, another key piece is women weren't allowed in combat roles at this time. And mm-hmm. I was really trying to like find myself. So I got into IT, didn't enjoy it, did a lot of this typical help desk, f- fixing printers. And then a couple of years later, I got this crazy newsletter from an officer of mine about this unique special forces program. It's called the Cultural Support Team Program. And long story really short, got selected, went through the process, deployed a couple of combat rotations, doing intelligence work for the Special Operations Command. That's where I stayed for the next 12 years, working not only in the cyberspace, but also electronic warfare, doing intelligence operations. And through that, it actually kind of segued me into cyber threat intel in 2019, kind of like doing a really quick fast forward. And so I was slowly, I was actually fighting it for a really long time to go into cyber or to even stay in technology because I just didn't know the how many jobs and what was available out there at the time. I really thought it was just help desk and SharePoint. So when I got the great opportunity to work for an amazing company in 19 doing CTI, the doors just kind of opened up for me. And then I started realizing, wow, there's so much more to the technology space than I knew. And it's been it's been amazing. And now today I do uh, government's risk and compliance. I also have my own company on the side and we do education. We provide education and resources through various different platforms. I, I get what you mean about how it's such a a big field IT and but then also cybersecurity specifically it's just I did not realize when I first started getting into it how many different niches there are um so that's very interesting to hear about kind of how you got to where you are now and where you started you did mention um how you you do like cybersecurity education is that through Outpost Gray it is yeah I started Outpost Gray's been around for a while it's been around actually since 15 we were an intelligence company working we had female operators like myself that used to do intelligence operations for subcontractors and then it just it, it's gone through probably three or four different refinements and then it was about a year and a half ago i decided let's launch it as a consulting firm in the cybersecurity space and then from there it had another facelift uh, almost a year ago where we were we decided let's take this down the educational route and that's when we launched our youtube and really focused on that I think a few of the videos that I watched featured uh, somebody that we've had as a guest previously on some of our webinars, Jerry Osier. And from what I could see, it looks like you guys co-authored a book with a few other people. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yes, Jerry is one of my most favorite people in the world, friend, mentor. He and I met a couple of years ago through another mutual friend, and he was wanting to write a book. And at the time, his platform, Simply Cyber, was really just getting started and developed. I think even in the book, there's a picture of his LinkedIn and I, because I did the section on social media and he only had maybe 1500 followers on his YouTube. And so he reached out to me. He was still really kind of starting out on his own too. And he said, hey, I want to write this book. And I asked him what his thoughts and ideas were around the book because I too wanted to write a book, but I really didn't have the vision for it just yet. And we came up with the idea of writing a book that would be directed towards individuals trying to break into the industry or maybe new career individuals. So that first three to five years and maybe doing career pivots. And the book was designed in three parts. The first part was really explaining what is cybersecurity. Uh, what are all the different like different frameworks, just understanding it before you wanted to dive into it. Then if you made it past that first section, 
Section two is let's tell you about how you can get education because there's various different routes, as you know, certification, college, uh, various hands on approaches. And then the last section was, OK, you've just now you know what cybersecurity is. You've decided your path. Now let's teach you how to get there. And so then we taught goal setting, branding and social media and all of the other intricate pieces that I think people forget about. So like you talked about, um, you've got Outpost Gray going on. I, I did watch an interview that you had done with Fox talking about SOAA, and you're a board member for them. Is that right? I am. Wow, you did your homework. <laughs> I tried. I promise I'm not a stalker. I was just like, oh my gosh, look at all these stuff that she's done. So I guess I'm just curious as to, you had talked about a something they had done specifically geared towards women that were in I believe it was either women in the special forces or women in cybersecurity. And I'm hoping that maybe you could shed some more light on that because I just think that's a very neat initiative to take on considering it seems like there's not as many women in this space, definitely more than there used to be, but it's still, you know, far outnumbered, I guess. Yeah. So, so a uh, special operations association of America is a nonprofit that I'm very passionate about. It actually got founded just a little over two years ago. I was one of the first members that were asked to be part of the found uh, of the organization. We were kind of like the founding members when Daniel Elkins, the founder of SOA started building out his team and the idea, and it still is the idea behind. So initially it was created to provide advocacy for special operators at the congressional level, because there's a lot of these nonprofits out there, a lot of non -vet veteran nonprofits that focus on serving veterans, but where the change really needs to happen is at the congressional level. And we weren't seeing that. And special operators have unique challenges that we face where, with our healthcare. And one of those are, for example, when we deploy, a lot of times we can't talk about our, our locations that we deploy to. So we come back, we have these unique injuries. And then when questioned or asked about where were you deployed, what were you doing, we're not able to provide that necessary information to receive the care that we deserve and we we need to have. And there's another aspect of that that's really unique. And you touched on it, which is that female aspect. And where I'm really passionate about is being a cultural support team female that went out there. I deployed with these men side by side with them on two different combat rotations. I did what we call village stability operations, living in the villages with the Afghans. And I would work directly with the women and children, grabbing getting intelligence off of the women and children to help fill that intelligence gap. But there was another side, which we're call, it's called direct action. And that's where we went into actual combat with our male special forces operators. And when they would go into a compound, we would fall directly behind them. So we weren't in the back. We weren't waiting. We were actually in the mix. We were returning fire. At the same time, we were also there to question the women and children. And a lot of us, when we've come back, majority of us, I actually don't know a single woman that has told me they haven't had challenges with this. When we've come back from our deployment and we started seeking health, like care, receiving health care, none of our challenges were being seen as equal. So our male counterparts could go in, say the exact same injury and be able to receive treatment for care where I would go in, I would be immediately marginalized or discounted because A, I was a woman and then B, they would look at say my job, my MOS. So I was doing information technology. They would look at that versus being an actual combat veteran because women weren't allowed at that time to go into combat. And I mentioned that earlier. So there's there's all these challenges that we're facing. It's not just female operators, it's actually women across all of the military. But one thing that SOA has been able to do, and this is like historical, is in the next one to two weeks, there is legislation that is going to be presented during a press release. And it is going to be legislation specifically for the cultural support team women, about 310 women who became a CST, deployed, came back, and are having these challenges. And the legislation will help us to receive access to healthcare. And it will also ask the DOD to retroactively go back into our records and change our records to show that we are indeed combat veterans. And so this is, this is all through SOA. This is something that I've been passionate about for the last couple of years, and it's actually coming to fruition. So back to your question about that event and what I was talking about, that event was to bring 
not only the the female operators together, but it also brought male operators together. And then some of our Afghan partners that we were working with when we were downrange, because we were actually training women operators in Afghanistan, like Afghan female operators. And we were able to bring them home when the drawdown happened. So we were, it was a collective event where we all got to come together. Wow. It sounds like that, the, I mean, the legislation that you were talking about is just a long time coming. So I'm glad to hear yeah. that that's finally coming to fruition. And wow, what a story. So speaking of your your time in the military, what was it like when you, you decided to go a different direction? You ended up kind of switching gears. What was it like to transition to civilian life and working sort of, I guess, in, in the civilian sector? It was one of the most challenging things for me to do. And it wasn't because the work was hard. It was trying to speak a new language and trying to integrate into a culture that I had known for so long. Thankfully, and I say thankfully because I see a lot of individuals that stay in for 20, 30, you know, 40 years in the military and then they try the transition. And I did a little over 15 where I was full time in that uniform in some capacity. And for me, what was unique and I and it's very common, it's like what made you successful as a female operator in the military isn't typically what is going to make you successful in corporate America. Because in the military, emotions were not a thing. You were very aggressive because you had other, you're in a very alpha environment. And so you have to elevate yourself to that level. And they have a saying in the special ops that selection never ends. You're always being evaluated, even when you are selected. And for women, I feel like you work twice as hard. Every time you go into a new unit, you have to you have to be reassessed. They watch you. You have to prove yourself. So going into corporate world, like you and I, I had to learn how to talk to you in a different way. I had to learn how to talk to my male civilians in a different way because I came off too aggressive to the women. I came off too aggressive to the male. And it was like almost an identity crisis where I had to kind of refine myself and really find myself, but without losing myself, if that makes sense, just to be able to make that transition successfully. And I see a lot of veterans, it, it, it's extremely hard sometimes to make that transition successfully because you do have to shed a portion of yourself that made you really successful in the military to make it in the civilian world. You still got all this experience that probably I would imagine still comes in handy to a degree or it, it is still part of who you are. But yeah, having to completely shift how you communicate with people and, and just how you act and everything that that would be yeah quite an identity crisis. Um, but I mean, clearly you're, you're thriving now. So whatever you did, you did it right. It worked. So the other thing that I know that you've spoken about before that kind of resonated with me, and I, I'll be honest with you, I was a little relieved to hear it, is I've seen in other interviews you talk a little bit about imposter syndrome and sort of feeling that way in your field and everything. And I'm, like I said, I'm still very new to this, but it's definitely a feeling of like, even if I'm doing things well, and even if I'm you know passing tests or whatever it is that I'm doing, there's still a part of me that's like, oh, am I really supposed to be here? Am I, am I, am I really going to fit in here? Do I really have what it takes? So I think that especially in a field where it seems like some people still think it's kind of a thing to be a woman in cybersecurity. How do you deal with that imposter syndrome and and how did you kind of gain that confidence in yourself and your abilities? Yeah, for me, I definitely had imposter syndrome when I got my first CTI job in 2019. And a lot of it wasn't just because of being a woman doing that big transition as well, but it was also from my childhood. And that was one of the reasons I I'd mentioned, I was really trying to stay away from technology and STEM just entirely. And I kept getting sucked into it because I truly didn't think I was smart enough. And that just came, I realized later that came from my childhood, from being told you, you're not very good at math. Um, I was in college at one time going for digital forensics IT degree. And I remember being told by one of my parents, you should probably just drop the course. This probably just isn't for you. Mm -hmm. And so I had all these reinforcements in my younger days. And I, and I look at it now, it was very generational. Like we weren't as supportive of women to get into a STEM 
uh, STEM course, anything, math, science. And I actually liked those courses, but as the years went on and you have those reinforcements, I started realizing anytime I had a challenge along my life, I just immediately assumed you're just not smart enough for this. You should probably get out of IT or you should get out of cybersecurity. And it wasn't until I finally, for me, I... I started doing a lot of self-reflection on me. I started releasing a lot of those blocks. I actually, I went homeless in 2018 and that was really my huge turning point because that was when I had transitioned out of the military in 15, 16. I was going through a crisis. I didn't have the VA support with all of the medical that I, I was having so many like PTSD, depression, anxiety, I had all these issues I wasn't getting seen for. And there was a tipping point in 2018. And I'm thankful for that now because that made me stop and really do a ton of self-reflection. And what changed for me was changing how I thought about who I am internally through therapy, various different books that I read, just different types of meditation that through that and then getting rid of a whole bunch of toxic people, I then created this amazing circle. Jerry's one of those individuals that are in this really close circle of mine. And when I start feeling imposter syndrome, talking about writing the book, I wrote the first chapter of that book and it scared the crap out of me. I didn't, I started writing it going, who am I to write this book? And why does anybody want to listen to me? And I reached out to Jerry and I actually asked him, can you please review this chapter? And he did. And he wrote me and he said, it looks great. And it was like short and sweet. It looks great. Keep it up. And I'm like, oh my God, is he, <laughs> did he read it? Like, so for me, it was trusting in my abilities, having a tight group of like influential people. I have three. I know they say five is the number. I have three. And whenever I start feeling like maybe I'm not in the right spot, maybe I like, maybe I shouldn't be a manager. Maybe I shouldn't be in this role. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about this. I just reach out to my friends and I ask them for the advice. And I just keep reminding myself of my abilities. So you've, you've talked a little bit about your, how you've trans had a few different transitions in your life, how there was a period where you were actively kind of avoiding IT thinking like, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. And then finally, like, this is what I'm going to do. So outside of, like you said, kind of getting a, a circle of people you can trust and reaching out to them for advice, this is like the million dollar question. Is there any other advice that you would offer women or just people in general that are looking to get in cybersecurity, but maybe don't have that confidence or aren't really sure where to start? Yeah. And I'm, and I have to, anybody that's listening to this that might be in this place right now, I just have to first tell you I've been there. Um, I've experienced that going, I know I'm not happy where I'm at right now, but I have no idea where I want to get. So the best advice I can tell you is the first thing is you just have to take action. And some of the advice I would tell you on those action steps would be find people in the community who you look up to and that you want them as a mentor or a coach or even a friend. Start LinkedIn is my favorite platform. Start following and connecting with them on whatever social media platform you desire and just engage, just start talking. And I promise you, if you write an individual in this space, unless they just don't have the time and you're just open with them and you share a little bit about yourself and just say, I'm so-and-so, I'm wanting to transition in this space. I'm not really sure where to start. Could you take a couple of minutes, maybe hop on a call or give me some advice? they're going to try to help you out. I promise you. Um, I've had people reach out to me and I always try to take time to at least respond. I might not be able to hop on a one-on-one -on -one call always, but reach out, make that effort, but don't stop at one. If, if that person doesn't respond, do it again, do it again. I promise you somebody out there is going to see your potential and they're going to help you out. So this is sort of a, sort of an open-ended question. It's okay if there's no answer to it. I'm curious if there's any stories about all the different experiences, different experiences, different jobs that you've had. Are there any stories that you love to tell? I didn't say this earlier, but um, the legislation is actually named after me and it's kind of creeping me wow. out. Wow. Yeah. It's called the Jack Stack. Yeah. It's a little crazy. How cool. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really cool. So when they told me that, I almost cried. And I was like, not going to cry in front of a congressman. But yeah, it was a that's a huge deal. They were like, we want to let you know what we're going to call this legislation for the CSTs. And then they told me it was the Jack Stack. And I was, I, I'm like, 
I just, yeah, there was like watershed moment. Um, there was like tears, but not thankfully just completely flowing down my face. <laughs> but I think for me, that moment, it made me realize that all the fighting that I had done for all these years to, for all of the medical challenges that I'm facing, I have a traumatic brain injury that I deal with on a daily basis that I'm currently going through a formal investigation to prove that it was combat related. And I have fought years and years and years for all of my medical. And I will say, if it wasn't because I was continuously getting denied and all of these challenges, this legislation wouldn't be happening. And it's not, it's great that it, I mean, very cool that it's going to be called the Jax Act, but more importantly, it's going to impact 310 women's lives. And that's what matters the most to me. And who knows how many more in the future too. I would imagine yeah. this, is, this is kind of going 100%. forward. That's wow. That's awesome. And to yeah. know that, you know, long time coming, hard fought battle, but that it's finally going to come to fruition. That's awesome. Congratulations. That is so cool. Well, Jax, thank you so much for sitting down and, and talking with me a little bit today. It's been awesome to be able to hear your story, where you started, where you are now, all the things you've learned and done along the way. And I appreciate you kind of speaking to your experience because it, it really does serve as an inspiration for people like me and, and other people that are just now getting into this field or any field and just aren't sure where to start. So thank you. I appreciate you giving us some of your time today. Thank you, Sophie. It was my pleasure. So happy to be here. Love what you guys are doing. <laughs>